Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, on behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists and Narayana Hrudhyalaya, I welcome you to this uh, webinar on ischemic heart disease. I am Dr. Murlida, Director of Academics of Narayana Hrudhyalaya and also the Dean of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, speaking to you from Bangalore. First of all, I would like to wish you a very happy new year and hoping for the best in this year 2021. And also I give you best wishes for Pongal today and tomorrow. It's a major festival here. And uh, one announcement is that we'll be starting 
a certificate course in cardiac ultrasound in association with cardiac surgeons, cardiac anesthesiologists, and echocardiography societies in India. And the details will be shared with you shortly. Coming to this webinar, as you are aware, ischemic heart disease is a leading cause of death both in developed and developing nations of the world. Actually, as much as 30% of all deaths are because of ischemic heart disease. And unfortunately, Indians are three times, or Asians, I mean, see, Asians are three times more vulnerable, vulnerable to ischemic heart disease. So it is no great surprise that we encounter these patients even in non-cardiac surgical situations. And the general anesthesiologist is expected to know the basics of ischemic heart disease. And it's likely that every third or fourth adult patient you encounter in the operating rooms has some form of cardiovascular disease. With this background, we have devised this uh, webinar to cover most of the uh, most of the salient points regarding ischemic heart disease, and I would welcome you for this meeting. And I have great pleasure to invite Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram, Dr. Sanjeevni Inamdar, to take over and conduct the session. Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram and Sanjeevni Inamdar both are eminent anesthesiologists, and I do not think they need any introduction. Everybody knows them. No, I would just simply hand over the stage to Dr. Meenakshi Sundram and uh, Sanjeev Meenamdar to conduct the session. I'll be with you all the time. And the last half an hour of this session is devoted to question and answers. Please feel free to ask any question or please feel to comment at the end. Thank you so much. Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram and Sanjeev Meenamdar, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Murlidhar. <clears throat> really, this is an important topic, and certainly each one of us are going to get benefited out of this. India is the uh, number one ki having killer disease in a maximum number in the world because the arteries are small, the eating habits are wrong. There are so many, so many causes for that. And for this important topic, I call upon Dr. Manjula Sarkar to speak on pathophysiology of ischemic heart disease. Manjula, who is a dear friend of mine, she needs no introduction at all. She has been uh, HOD of cardiac anesthesia in the premier institute of KM Hospital, Mumbai. And she has trained so many cardiac anesthesia students all these years and conducted and done uh, these cardiac surgery operation theaters, which are really busy. We all know that. And that's not all. She is now again HOD in a premier institute of DY, DY Patil College in Navi, Mumbai. And she is speaking on pathophysiology. Delegates, this is important. Pathophysiology is very important. And I'm sure she will walk us through this important topic and there are many hidden answers to all the questions. I'm sure about it. So Manjula, please start with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your kind introduction. At present, I'm working as a uh, professor in charge cardiac in DY Patil Medical College. As cardiac anesthesia department is not separated in DY Patil, so we are trying our best. And the topic allotted to me for the day is pathophysiology of ischemic heart disease. And uh, now I'm starting my lecture. Just a minute. So if you see the pathophysiological changes because of the ischemic heart disease, what is the pathophysiology behind that? 
and all of us are concerned of the pathophysiological changes of the ischemic heart disease as a cardiac anesthesiologist as well as general anesthesiologist should do. Because whenever we are dealing with any patient who is ischemic, who is having the ischemic heart disease, whether the, that patient is in cardiac theater or in non-cardiac theater, the important thing is uh, we should know the pathophysiology. Then only you can plan your anesthesia and you can just uh, go ahead according to the uh, disease. So coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease is because of the imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and the demand. And the cause is atherosclerosis of the coronary artery. Regional reduction in myocardial flow and inadequate supply by the involved coronary artery is the reason. It includes angina, may be stable or non-stable, myocardial infarction, heart failure, or arrhythmias too. When we look at the risk factors for ischemic heart disease, they can be non-modifiable and modifiable. As Madam Sanjeevini said, that non-modifiable, we can't do anything. Age, family history, sex, personality, it is already existing or it is there. But modifiable can be changed. So what are the risk factors which can be modified? They are comorbidities like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, ischemia, smoking, family history, diabetes, or obesity too. Smoking and alcohol and dietary pattern, all these can be changed. So what are the types of the ischemic heart disease? They are stable angina, acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, ST segment changes or non-ST segment elevation or sudden cardiac death. Now, how the oxygen supply and demands get disturbed? Oxygen content of the arterial blood, coronary blood flow may get disturbed. Oxygen demand by contactility of the heart, afterload, preload, or heart rate. Now, what are the major determinants of the myocardial oxygen demand? Myocardial wall tension, contactility, and heart rate. Now, determinants of the oxygen supply are coronary blood flow, arterial oxygen content, coronary blood flow, because of the diastolic arterial pressure changes, LVEDP, potency of the coronary arteries and coronary vascular tone, arterial oxygen content are because of the hemoglobin and oxygen saturation. If you see this picture, you come to know the heart is supplied by the two main vessels, right and left coronary artery. The left main coronary artery is dividing into left anterior descending and left circumference coronary artery. Right is part, in this part of the heart, right side of the heart. So coronary blood flow maintained due to change in arterial resistance, coronary perfusion pressure, and alteration in the blood pressure. So what is the pathogenesis behind this? If you see this picture, you come to know the microcirculation of the artery or the heart is going to get affected by many things. So epicardial and myocardial coronary artery stenosis leads to progressive vasodilatation of the arteries and arterioles preserve the basal flow at the cost of reserve. If coronary perfusion reduces below 40 mm of mercury, the autoregulation of subendocardial coronary flow loss. And if MBO2 increases above available reserve, then signs and symptoms of the ischemia develop. So basically, the microcirculation is going to get affected because of the main stimulus of the vessel motion, primary function gets affected, transport, regulation, and exchange of the oxygen, and percentage of the resistance to flow. Now, if you see this slide, this slide tells us what is the endothelial dysfunction occurs, how the endothelial dysfunction occurs. So this is the normal endothelium when the surgical stimulus occurs because of whatever is the reason, there is an hypoxia, leads to oxidative stress and leads to vasospasm and there is an spasm and the oxygen suffers. So in normal endothelium, the balance of vasoactive mediators favors the vasodilatation and the antithrombotic effect occurs. But in atherosclerosis, endothelium dysfunction contributes to myocardial ischemia. Now, how the inappropriate vasoconstriction of coronary arteries occurs? Dysfunctional endothelium is unable to release nitric oxide in response to platelets 
product release from pore rupture and thrombus formation hence vasoconstriction predominant and flow of arterial lumen is compromised and loss of normal anti thrombotic properties of injured endothelium occur and all these leads to decrease in coronary blood flow and ischemia occurs so whenever there is an injury there is collection of the platelets and thrombus forms now role of platelets in thrombus formation all of us know it whether they are cardiac anesthetists or non cardiac anesthetists so whenever there is an injury collection of the platelets and thrombus is forming so anti angiogenic agent leads to angiogenic growth factors and cytokines and endothelial and immune cell migration and vascularization occurs what happens when the atherosclerosis is not there so non atherosclerotic causes of ischemia it is c decrease coronary perfusion pressure cause may be any decrease blood oxygen content again the cause may be any and increase in myocardial oxygen demand because of rapid tachycardia acute hypertension severe aortic stenosis these causes can be taken care so unusual coronary abnormalities is inflammation severe transient transient ischemia and congenital defect now what are the consequences of ischemia on myocardium inadequate myocardium oxygenation accumulation of metabolic waste products reversible myocardial injury and irreversible myocardial necrosis occurs which leads to ischemia so few terminologies we are going to use for the myocardium what is stent myocardium tissue with prolonged systolic dysfunction even after the return of the normal blood flow magnitude of stunning is proportional to the degree of ischemia delayed recovery of function is due to accumulation of myocyte calcium and oxygen derived free radicals and abnormalities lead to contractility of the heart function get disturbed what is hibernating myocardium tissue with chronic ventricular dysfunction in response to a chronic reduced blood supply like in multi vessel disease if blood flow is restored dynamics is reversible and ventricular function improved now what is myocardial infarction myocytes necrosis as a result of prolonged myocardial ischemia amount of tissue infarction depends on mass perfused impaired coronary blood flow oxygen demand of the affected region adequacy of collector vessel and degree of tissue ischemia now what is ischemic syndrome based on the timing and severity of insert stable angina unstable angina variant angina silent ischemia and syndrome x now this is the picture showing where the angina pectoris or myocardial infarction pain occurs so heart right and left shoulder now canadian classification of angina is most popular classification which everybody is trying to follow the class 1 to class 2 class 1 no angina with ordinary activity class 2 with a uh, little bit of activity uh class 3 is small activity and class 4 is even at rest so what is the stable angina pattern of chronic predictable transient angina during exertion of emotional stress caused by the fixed obstructive atherosclerotic plaque severity of the symptoms are related to degree of stenosis and dilatory capacity of the resistant vessel what is unstable angina acceleration of symptoms from stable angina a sudden increase in the rate and duration of ischemic episode with lesser exertion even at rest can be precursor to an acute myocardial infarction typically involves rupture of an unstable atherosclerotic plaque with platelet aggregation and thrombosis what are the variant angina episodes of focal coronary artery spasm in the absence of the plaque mechanism <laughs> hypothetic activity increases and endothelial dysfunction occurs occurs at rest result from a transient reduction in coronary oxygen supply so if you see this vessel the whenever there is a coronary spasm because of whatever is the reason the ischemia occurs and the heart gets occurs what is silent ischemia cardiac ischemia with absence of perceptible discomfort or pain occurs in typical symptomatic angina are with the only manifestation of cd and pathophysiology is unknown what is syndrome x symptoms of angina pectoris with no evidence of significant cd on angiogram but inadequate vasodilatation during increased myocardial oxygen demand is the cause 
So acute coronary syndromes are unstable in China, non-ST elevation myocardium, ST elevation myocardial infarction, thrombus type, partially occluded, partially occluded, completely occluded, myocardial necrosis, absent here, but it is present in a small amount and in large amount. And CHM biomarkers are absent here, but present in both the conditions. Now, what are the early biochemical changes in infarction minutes to days? Drop in tissue oxygen level, rapid conversion from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, impaired glycolysis and ATP production, leads to impaired contractile protein function, systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction and accumulation of the tissue necrotic product. Now, impairment of transmembrane sodium potassium ATPH due to impaired ATP production, increased intracellular sodium, increased extracellular potassium, this leads to intracellular edema and electrical instability. Increased intracellular calcium leads to activation of degradative lipase and causes the tissue necrosis. So, acute inflammatory response with infiltration of neutrophils and other tissue products occurs. What are the late changes in infarction days to weeks? Resorption of irreversibly dead myocytes by macrophages, weaknesses of ventricular wall and susceptibility to myocardial rupture, and fibrous tissue deposition and scarring occurs. So ventricular demodeling occurs when the infarct is expanded, triggering a dilatation of the necrotic tissue, ventricular wall stress, impairment in systolic function occurs, and aneurysm may be there. Remodeling of non-infarcted ventricles, dilatation of overworked non-infarcted segments subject to increased wall rest and compensates by increasing cardiac output, predisposes to ventricular arrhythmias and leads to heart failure. So what is atherosclerosis, hardening of the vessel, the pre-process, internal thickening, repeat accumulation. These processes together produce atheromatous plaque. Now, development of the atheromatous plant, which factor we have already discussed, leads to atherosclerosis, thrombosis, and it can go into the brain, heart, and other vascular structures. So, atherosclerotic plaque, how it develops whenever there is an injury, collection of the platelets, and the thrombus form, and lumen gets reduced. So, ulceration and disruption results in thrombotic occlusion and distal embolization. Now, early atherosclerosis, the lumen remains same, there is a small plaque, but as soon as the plaque uh, ruptured or gets dislodged, the lumen gets reduced. So, this is a normal lumen with plaque, this is the lumen has reduced the plaque size and there is a complete thrombus and the complete occlusion of the lumen. So, this happens in the myocardial infarction or at the segment elevation, myocardial infarction is there. Now, what is the different types? Everybody knows there is a small disruption, so endothelial gets damaged, collection of the fat, collection of the flat, thrombus is forming, lumen is getting reduced, <coughs> and complete disruption of the complete destruction of the lumen. How they progress? One, two, five. And main growth mechanism growth mainly by lipid accumulation up to grade four, and after that it happens the accelerated increased muscle and collagen increases. From first decade, from third decade, and from fourth decade. Clinical correlation, clinical is silent, and clinical is silent and overt. So whenever there is a thrombus formation, the thrombus discloses and can go to heart, brain, limb, and aneurysm occurs in the major vessel of the heart. So complications of myocardial infarction, depending on which part of the body is going to get affected, which part of the heart is going to get affected, Stroke embolization, cardiac shock, arrhythmias, pericarditis, or mitral regurgitation depending on the tissue necrosis and size. So, after looking all these things, I would like to conclude that knowledge and understanding of pathophysiology of ischemic heart disease is must for all anesthesiologists in view of conduct of these cases for cardiac or non cardiac surgeries for better outcome. Early diagnosis and timely management is must. Helps in preventing perioperative complications if you know the etiopathology well. And cardiac anesthesia doesn't mean that we are doing the case only in cardiac uh, theater. It means that any cardiac patient is coming for any surgery and you are dealing with that patient. And if you know the pathophysiology, I'm sure your conduction of anesthesia is going to be better and outcome will be better. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity mm -hmm. to speak here.
and these are the references which I have taken for my talk. Again, thanks to ICA, Dr. Murli, Sanjeevani, all. Thank you. Thank you, Manjula. It was a very comprehensive and absolutely uh, clear picture of pathophysiology of the heart, and it is going to help everyone, of, all of us. Uh, I request Dr. Minakshi to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjeevani, madam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murli Dhar, sir. The next speaker, Dr. Aloka Samantare, is working in the most auspicious place in the entire country. He is working in Tirupati, Venkateshwara Institute of Medical Sciences. He is a professor and a HOD. Uh, he has uh, 23 years of uh, experience and he has uh, published uh, 36 national papers and uh, 10 international papers. But the credit worthiness is he has won the prestigious uh, Professor Satpati Award for the best original paper and he has won Cops Award also. And he is going to talk about the approach to NCS in IHD. I request, sir, to stick to the time limit of 15 minutes. Sir, over to you. Has it come or not? Thank you, Dr. Minaki, for a nice introduction. I think, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, a very good evening to all the panelists. And uh, uh, let me start by thanking ICA for giving this opportunity. And uh, it's not very uncommon in any tertiary care setup to have a patient with ischemic heart disease coming for a non cardiac surgery. The Usual risk involved in this type of cases when they come, either it could be because of a supply demand mismatch, because sometimes the myocardial metabolism far exceeds the blood supply that can be met by the stenosis coronary artery, or sometimes it is because of the altered flow dynamics that gives rise to a rupture in the plate and finally giving rise to acute coronary syndrome in form of either non STEMI or STEMI. The risk that we are talking of when you deal with this type of case perioperatively is either a development of perioperative myocardial infarction, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, heart failure, complete heart block, or cardiac death. These are collectively called, or three or four of these collectively called as major adverse cardiovascular event. When we need to deal with this type of case, one should remember that the cardiac Clearance is not equivalent to cardiac risk stratification. That means many of these patients who by different indices will have a low risk of development of one of this problem may not actually develop this type of major adverse cardiovascular event. So one should very well remember this is only a cardiac risk stratification and the actual risk may vary depending on how you evaluate or what are the factors available for you to evaluate. It doesn't give a complete cardiac clearance so that the, all these factors can be avoided completely. Basically, the perioperative risk evaluation based on the six steps, history and physical examination, urgency of the surgery, different model risk indices, functional status, availability of the biomarkers, and the different non-invasive testing that is available. Let us look into each one of these. Whatever may be the type of surgery, whether it's emergency surgery or urgent surgery or elective surgery, there is always little time is available to go into a focus history because there is no substitute for a good history and physical examination. In this type of case, particularly, one should look for the recent myocardial infarctions, presence of any unstable cardiac conditions, if there was any coronary revascularization attempt in the last five years, whether the patient had any percutaneous intervention in the form of a stent in the last six months, what type of current medication the patient is having, particularly in relation to the antiplatelet drugs, beta blockers, starting nitrates, and comorbidities like diabetes mellitus and renal failure, because all these have a major impact in classifying the patient into different strata of risk. 
as i said whether it is a emergency surgery or the urgent surgery a baseline ecg or bedside ecg goes a long way in uh, helping in deciding about the current rhythm of the patient's presence of left ventricular hypertrophy and electrolyte moreover it is also work as a baseline comparison for the post operative changes in the electrocardiography things the second thing that also may be some people may favor is doing a resting echocardiography because even in emergency surgery because in the most of the tertiary care center it may be available so a focus ultrasonography or echocardiography with a handheld probe is also very good because many a times 80% of the patients who have asymptomatic lv dysfunctions they pose some problem in the post operative periods so with a handheld echocardiography this can be very well uh, found in the pre operative period but with the advance of the biomarkers this has been gone out of favor in few of the society guidelines if the patient is not going for emergency it is said if the patient is going for emergency a simple ecg and echo and one can proceed to the surgery if the patient is not in emergency then one should look for the unstable cardiac condition the unstable cardiac conditions are either it's unstable angina acute heart failure significant arrhythmias symptomatic valvular heart disease and any recent mitral infarction if these things are there then probably we need to go for a multidisciplinary team approach to decide whether delaying the surgery will be helpful or the patient need to have certain intervention in the pre operative period itself like whether it's patient to go for a percutaneous intervention or patient need a change in or continuation of the antiplatelet drugs what he is getting sometime even it also may influence the type of surgical procedure that you will be carrying out like for example a more invasive procedure can be changed into a less invasive procedure like a simple angioplasty in place of infrainguinal bypass surgery for a blockage of the artery once the patient it was found that patient is neither emergency and patient do not have an unstable cardiac condition there are two ways to certify the risk for them as per the european guidelines one can look into the risk of the surgery or as per the american guideline one can go for the revised cardiac risk index which combines the patient factors and the surgical risk factor at the same time so far the risk of surgery is concerned the european guidelines is divided this into three groups low risk intermediate risk and high risk with the risk of major adverse cardiovascular event being less than 1% of the low risk but the american guidelines has simplified this they have combined the intermediate risk and high risk into a single group of high risk which has a adverse cardiovascular event event of more than 1% so all the type of surgery comes under elevated surgical risk except for the four surgeries sir, that is ophthalmic surgery breast surgery superficial surgery and endoscopic surgeries if patient is undergoing one of the low risk surgery then probably no further testing is required except one can either think of continuing or initiating a beta blockers if the patient is having ischemic heart disease or starting a ac inhibitor or starting depending on whether it's a vascular surgery or the patient is having a heart failure or not and the dapt need to be adjusted for the requirement if it's a high risk surgery then probably one has to go for the revised cardiac index as per the american guidelines the revised cardiac risk index basically con- basically consists of six factors you can get from the history itself that is ischemic heart disease presence of congestive heart failure and a history of cerebral vascular accident we should look for two comorbidity like a diabetes or a serum plating of more than 40 a high risk surgery that is a any supraanguinal vascular surgery or intraperitoneal or thoracic surgery each score was given a point of 1 and it was said that any person who is having either no risk factor or only one risk factor they comes under low risk of major adverse cardiovascular event and those patients who have either two or more than two factors they comes under elevated risk of ms any patients who have the low risk of rci rcri they can proceed directly to the surgery with the available investigation no further investigation is required and a patient who is having a elevated mes that is either having a two or more than two factors then one should look for the functional capacity 
functional capacity is basically it's a self reported functional capacity here one should look that whether the patient is having a functional capacity of more than 4 met that means a 4 met means 1 met is equivalent to around 3.5 ml of oxygen consumption per kg per minute so 4 met means one should look at least that patient should have at least more than 15 ml of oxygen consumption per minute that can be easily verified if the patient is able to climb two flight of stairs that means around Uh, 15 to 25 stairs if he is able to climb or patient able to walk up a hill or patient can walk in a level ground at a speed of around 6 km per hour 6 to 6.5 km per hour for at least 100 meters in case the patient is having more than 4 met functional status despite its a elevated risk still one can proceed for the surgery without any further investigations but if the patient is in the lower functional status group that means he is not able to meet or go exceeds more than 4 met then probably we need to go for the different biomarkers stress testing or going for a ct angiography the next non invasive testing is stress ecg or the imaging modality both us guidelines and the american guidelines uh, european guidelines favor use of stress imaging either exercise stress testing by using dobutamine or a image stress testing however the main problems with this type of testing is it needs facility to be available to do a scintigraphy or it needs expertise to interpret the things the cost of this investigation sir and finally the inconclusive results in many of these cases for example all these cases all this type of test they have a very low positive predictive value that means whatever may be the result sometime the patient do not actually land up in any of the major adverse cardiovascular event despite it being predicted on a stress imaging tracing when it was said that it's the coronary vessels anatomy of the sternal coronary vessel that is getting all the problem many has favored the use of coronary computed tomography angiography or simply it's a ct angiography but here again the problem is a negative cct clearly identify a low mass irrespective of the crri but however a positive cca usually it's overestimate the risk but we can predict with a simple rci score if we are using a cctra then probably it overestimate the risk and that unnecessarily influence the treatment decision for the patients it was said that the biomarkers along with the rci work wonder it was said that whenever the rci of more than 2 is analyzed along with one of these biomarkers the discriminatory power of revised cardiac risk index almost increases by more than three fold the commonly used biomarkers are bnp or nt pro bnp which are released in response to myocardial failure because of the stretching of the heart muscles with or without ischemia the canadian society usually has prescribed this type of biomarker evaluation for almost all category of patients all patients above 65 year and even in the younger age group even if they are having a functional status of less than 4 or a revised cardiac risk index of more than 1 or more than 2 factors for all types of surgery except vascular surgery So how to interpret a stress testing? As I said, a stress testing usually gives many times a negative predictive value, or sometimes the. Hello. Please answer. Yes, madam. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alok and Dr. Minakshi, it was a wonderful uh, session of uh, non-cardiac uh, surgery. i think uh, there is a audio problem now i take up the responsibility of introducing uh, dr ragu dr ragu is a md pdcc he is a senior consultant in department of cardiac anesthesia in narayana group only 
and he has 18 years of experience in cardiac anesthesia and he is very much interested in uh, valve repair surgeries and PEE for which Narayan Hridalya is very well known. Over to Dr. Raghu. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Today, I'm going to in briefly talk about anesthesia for off-arm surgery. Coming to the introduction, the evolution of techniques and knowledge of beating heart surgery has led anesthesia towards the development of newer procedures and innovations to promote patient safety and ensure high standards of care. Off-arm CABG has shown to have some advantages when compared to on-arm surgery, particularly in, redu in reducing the post-operative complications. Coming to the uh, hist historical aspects, the first open heart surgery was done by John Gibson in 1952, and first successful off-arm surgery was done in 1961. And uh, the first use of uh, metonic octopus system was uh, done in 1998. Coming to the definition of off-arm surgery, in off-arm surgery, the heart is beating and the grafts, uh, by, bypass grafts are performed in a beating heart without uh, the patient on heart-lung machine. Whereas in a bypass surgery, the heart is stuck or the heart is beating on the uh, CPB machine and we can bypass the uh, occluded coronary grafts. And coming to the types of CABG, on pump uh, CABG, we can do either the on pump beating heart surgery or in cardioplegic arrested heart CABG. Whereas uh, the off pump CABG can be done but through the midline sternotomy or the left lateral thoracotomy, laser revascularization, or endoscopic CABG or hybrid CABG. Uh, CABG for a single graft with PTCA done to the other uh, grafts. This, this is called as a hybrid CABG. The, coming to the anesthetic approach, there are three anesthetic approach for a off-form CABG. One is uh, with general anesthesia with opiates and inhalation anesthesia. Next, the second one is the general anesthesia with controlled ventilation with uh, high thoracic epidural or combined GA with intrathecal uh, uh, morphine, uh, uh, this one. Or the, the third one is uh, awake regional anesthesia with spontaneous ventilation using thoracic epidural um, alone. The coming to the goals of anesthesia, the main goal is uh, to provide a safe anesthesia for an uncompromised patient using a technique that offers maximum cardiac protection and stability, maintain the hemodynamics uh, first uh, with physiological and then with pharmac pharmacological uh, methods, and at the end of the operation, allowing the patient for early emergence and ambulation and uh, have providing the adequate pain relief in the post-operative uh, period. The pre-op assessment uh, uh, coming, uh, the, you should know all the baseline blood investigations. Uh, you should optimize the patient uh, if the patient is having uh, um, high risk factors like uh, diabetes, hypertension, all these things uh, should be optimized. Corrected uh, Doppler uh, of the corrected uh, arteries uh, should be done, particularly if the patient age is above 65. And transthoracic echo, chest X-ray, and ECG as a baseline investigation has to be done. Um, uh, Preoperative uh, assessment also includes the continuing uh, beta blockers uh, uh, should continue to receive in the same dose uh, just uh, before uh, your uh, this one. Antiplatelet medication should be stopped at least five to seven days prior to the surgery. AC inhibitors should be stopped uh, within uh, with uh, 24 to 34 hours before surgery. And the low molecular weight heparin should be um, uh, 12 hours, um, last dose should be 12 hours prior to the surgery or unfractionated heparin should be stopped four to six hours prior to the surgery. And pre-medication, usually pre-medicate with benzodiazepine or anxiolytics uh, and can be used. Coming to the monitoring, once a patient comes to the operating uh, room, we uh, connect the ECG leads with ST analysis and the saturation probe has to be connected. And uh, once uh, this is connected, uh, um, uh, we have to uh, put uh, oxygen to the patient, uh, uh, either by the um, uh, face mask or or with the nasal prong. After that, we will secure a wide uh, bore IV cannula and uh, we secure invasive lines. Uh, either it can be radial or uh, femoral. Femoral we usually we use when the LV function is less than 30 to 40 so that some inadvent uh, if, um, uh, happens during the surgery, the, um, uh, the surgeon himself can put an IABP and uh, 
we can also put the pulmonary artery catheter if the EF is less than 40%, if the LV version, there is a significant abnormality in the LV function, uh, and if the LV EDP is more than 18 mm of HT at rest and recent MI and unstable antenna, and any complications of MI like EST, LV aneurysm, mitral regurgitation in CCF and emergency combined procedures can be done. After uh, we intubate the patient, we put the central line to monitor the central venous pressure and TE can uh, be uh, used to identify the myocardial ischemia early by detecting regional wall motion abnormalities either during intraoperatively or uh, postoperatively. But the major disadvantage uh, in off-home surgery is we are not able to image uh, myocardium because uh, the, the heart is lifted up or the heart uh, will be lifted up either putting a, a cotton mop in the pericardium and the urine output should be monitored and the temperature should be monitored. Then coming to the induction, usually the induction should be slow. It's usually induced uh, um, uh, with the injection uh, fentanyl three to four mics per uh, uh, kg because all these patients are compromised. Um, uh, one the brain arm circulation will be prolonged, time will be prolonged. And with the midazolam 0.03 to 0.05 mix per uh, uh, kg with the sleep dose of injection ethomidate as it is uh, myocardial stable drug and by inhalation drugs either with isoflurane or sevoflurane at 1 to 2 percent MAC. We usually use rocuronium at 1 milligram per kg for uh, a, um, it's a neuromuscular blockage uh, just prior to the intubation and maintenance is achieved with the infusion of fentanyl, uh, either uh, rocuronium or tracuronium torin as an inhalation anesthetic agent. In coming to the intraoperative management, if the patient has got hypotension, we usually treat with, with volume, head and low position, volume, and we look at the heart rate is in sinus rhythm. And uh, if uh, there is uh, uh, increase, uh, it, uh, we can increase the uh, afterload to maintain the systemic perfusion either with the inotropic support. First, we start with the uh, epinephrine, dopamine, or dovitamine. If still hypo Tension is persisting. We can also use phenylephrine at 100 to 150 mics bolus, and you can get the systemic pressure uh, uh, up from the surgeon to remove the cotton mouth under the heart or epicardial st stabilizer should be repositioned. The resting the heart in the pericardium can um, uh, make the pressure come up, or if still there is no improvement, an IAVP has to be instituted. If uh, there is an arrhythmia, sir. We use uh, lignocaine 1 to 2 milligrams per kg body weight or amidron 150 to 300 milligrams bolus uh, slowly because it causes hypotension. If arrhythmias are caused by electrolyte uh, disturbances, then we start potassium infusion or magnesium chloride. And uh, intraoperatively, we have to prevent uh, hypothermia either with the bl warm blanket covers in the preoperative period or to avoid spillage of cold fluids uh, across the patient and a warm IV fluid has to be given and use of uh, low fresh gas flow with carbon dioxide reabsorption circuit prevents the heat loss. And intraoperatively, we usually give two milligrams per kg body weight heparin to maintain the ECT more than 300 milligram and hourly 500 milligrams of IV heparin is should be maintained to keep ECT more than 300 milligram. And at the end of the surgery, heparinase is neutralized with injection protamine 1 milligram per 1 milligram of heparin. Of heparin. And uh, after the protamine, the ACT should be around 130 to 140 uh, seconds. And uh, myocardial prevention of myocardial ischemia, maintaining systolic blood pressure by keeping the mean arterial pressure at least 70 mm at all times uh, by administration of bolus of IV fluid in Trendelberg position or reduction of myocardial oxygen consumption by avoiding tachycardia by using beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Ischemia during distal anastomosis can be pre um, uh, prevented by using uh, intraluminal coronary shunts. These are the intraluminal shunts which are uh, double limb shunts that uh, fit into the proximal and distal end of the coronary artery and these are available in various uh, sizes. The main uh, advantage of these uh, shunts are the native coronary blood flow is maintained, uh, preventing intraoperative ischemia. Blood loss during coronary anastomosis is avoided and decreased. The coronary shunt prevents the embolization of either the carbon dioxide or the air, which we use during coronary anastomosis. 
the shunt prevents a surgeon from taking a suture on the posterior wall of the coronary artery. The presence of the shunt assures a proper coronary anastomosis, and insertion of uh, this shunt will reverse the changes of ischemia caused uh, by, uh, like uh, myocardial edema, endothelial and contractile dysfunction are all reversed. And uh, once uh, you use these uh, stabilizers for grafting, the baseline ECG, the amplitude uh, comes down when uh, you lift it. So when there are uh, ST changes, you should always look at the neutral position and then tell the patient is having uh, ischemia or not. These are the development of the modern uh, uh, epicardial stabilizers. Uh, this is a um, epicardium uh, stabilizer compressing devices. Uh, it is attached to the sternal retractor, which stabilizes the area um, uh, where uh, we are going to the anastomosis. Uh, because the stabilization devices cannot be used for the lateral or the posterior arteries, they developed with a newer uh, metronic uh, device, uh, the octopus, which is a compression and the suction devices which uh, not only compresses the myocardium, but also uh, uh, with the suction uh, um, uh, stabilizes uh, the epicardium so that uh, there is a um, uh, less uh, mobility of the myocardium during anastomosis. And this octopus, the newer octopus, can be used uh, uh, both for the lateral and posterior coronary artery anastomosis. And uh, this is the anastomosis where uh, they have uh, yeah, used uh, for the LAD anastomosis uh, um, uh, with the uh, compression and the suction device. And uh, in this, when you lift the heart, when there is a verticalization of the heart, we use a apical vacuum uh, positioning with uh, the um, uh, compression uh, device uh, with a um, uh, suction and uh, compressive device uh, type of octopus can be used for grafting uh, the posterior lateral arteries. The hemodynamic changes uh, during this position occurs because of three causes. The lifting and rotation uh, during off-form alters the hemodynamic changes which reduces the cardiac output stroke volume, left ventricular end diastolic pressure and the right atrial pressure. The right atrium has to pump the blood into the ventricle which is perpendicular to it. So the main uh, thing uh, um, uh, here is uh, um, the, um, the right atrium, you have to give adequate volume and if the volume has to enter from the atrium to the ventricle perpendicularly and it takes time. If the LA volume is not adequate, if the LA volume increases and your ventricle volume is increasing, then either you have to stop at that time and start your inotropic support. The pressure, the second cause for this hemodynamic changes are the pressure exerted by the retractor on the ventricle wall restricts the wall motion locally and reduces the ventricular dimensions. And finally, the verticalization of the heart during off-form disturbs the mitral or tricuspid annulus and it results in a significant uh, regurgitation of either valves. And during RCA grafting, sometimes bradycardia can be seen because uh, there is a reduction of blood supply to the sinus node and AV node and this happens uh, better to use atrial pacing or you can use uh, atropine. Coming to the, uh, uh, the use of thoracic epidural anesthesia, mostly in cardiac surgery, we, use, we put the epidural catheter one day before the cardiac uh, uh, operation uh, and um, uh, at, uh, C, um, at uh, C7 and T1 level and give a test dose and leave it and next day we shift the patient to the OT and again we test us whether there is a malposition of the catheter has spanned. The main advantage of uh, this uh, for trans uh, thoracic epidural anesthesia is it's an anti anginal effect, improves the myocardial oxygen balance, increases the luminal diameter of dynamic stenosis of epicard epicardial coronary arteries, reduces the myocardial work, reduces the total dose of anesthetic requirement intraoperative, and uh, proves uh, a good uh, postoperative uh, pain relief uh, management through the epidural catheter. Coming to the mid cam, the main advantages are shorter length of stay, shorter in lesser incision, shorter length of stay, faster recovery, less trauma, and uh, less uh, blood loss, and lower infection rate. But the major disadvantage is the surgeon should have a very high experience to do mid cam, and uh, the grafting uh, usually it will be less than two vessel involvement. If it is more than three or four vessel involvement, it is very difficult to do in mid cap. And uh, the anesthesia management for the mid-cap, you have to collapse one of the, the left uh, 
uh, lung uh, either by using the double uh, lumen tube or the bronchial blockers. And uh, usually when we want to do this uh, thoracotomy, the external defibril paddles has to be applied. And this is a bronchial blocker, which is which can be used uh, for blocking the left uh, lung. And here, this is uh, the position, the submammary incision uh, we put around uh, the four to five centimeters in the fifth, fifth, fifth intercostal space. And it is uh, the, um, the mid uh, thoracotomy. Uh, this one is exposed uh, where uh, we can see the lung, uh, the left lung is uh, collapsed. And here, uh, using the compression and uh, suction uh, device, we do LED to uh, Lima to LED anastomosis, which is uh, nicely seen in this uh, image. And uh, nowadays, because of this advances in the technology, we can also clamp the proximal iota, do the proximal vein graft, and we have uh, here, the other picture is showing, we have a position for the ramus intermediates where we have uh, grafting with a vein graft. And uh, with, uh, with the thing, uh, we have all, uh, also anastomosis sequentially from ramus intermediate to OM1 in mid-cap, which can be so for this graft, using the mid-cap operation. Coming to the post of management for in mid-cap, we can uh, use ultrasounded guided uh, nerve blocks, either uh, the pex block or the erector spinae paravertebral block, or if thoracic epidural is there, through that uh, we can uh, use a local anesthetist to manage the post-operative pain, or you can also use fentanyl infusion one mic per kg per hour with uh, um, uh, substituting with the fentanyl, we can also use a paracetamol 10 milligrams per kg or tramadol IV can also be used. Coming to the post-operative management, post-operative uh, usually um, these uh, cases should be monitored for the fresh ECG changes uh, and uh, as early as possible heparin has to be started, antiplatelet medication, if there are any fresh ECG changes, uh, you have to try to manage it uh, or uh, still uh, ST changes are uh, um, uh, not uh, reverting back, you can put an IBP or uh, we can also revise the graft and you have to monitor post-operatively the saturation, the PA, ETCO2, arterial blood pressure, temperature, ABG have to be taken immediately. And in the ICU, the patient is connected on the ventilator uh, with uh, 6 to 8 ml per kg body weight with respiratory rate uh, with uh, 12 to 15 respiratory rate on SIME mode. And ABG has to be done. If the PAO2 oxygenation is good, the FAO2 can be reduced to 0.4. And, um, um, and uh, later on, the pa um, patient, after one to two hours later, look for any blood loss. Uh, the fluid balance should not be more than 10 to 15 ml per, per uh, kg body weight. Core temperature should not be more than, should not be less than uh, 35 degrees, and there should be no arrhythmias. Urine output should not be less, uh, at least it should be one to two ml per kg uh, body weight. If a uh, resistor muscle blockage is present, then it has to be reversed uh, with uh, neostigmine and uh, glycoparallel. After confirming the adequacy of the reversal, the ventilator mode has to be changed to the spontaneous uh, mode. And uh, one, uh, after the patient is awake and patient is breathing spontaneously, look for the ABG. And uh, if the peripheries are uh, warm and uh, ABG shows no acidosis, uh, good urine output with uh, maintaining uh, the mean uh, pressure above 80, the, all these uh, patients can be extubated as early as possible. Coming uh, to the fast track in off-pump CABG, the main advantages here are the patient can be mobilized early, decreased length of stay in ICU and hospital, reduced complication of DVT, and reduced mortality and morbidity, better long-term outcome, and improved patient and family satisfaction uh, uh, can happen. This is a ultra uh, fast uh, tracking in cardiac anesthesia where uh, we can extubate the patient on table or uh, within uh, two hours of the surgery was published in uh, Maharashtra where uh, they have done uh, 40 cases out of which six were off pump and rest of our congenital uh, cases were 22. All these patients were extubated on table. Criteria they kept for patient awake, responsive and cooperative, vital capacity more than 6 ml per kg body weight, echo and uh, TE findings were normal, PAO2 more than 80 with FIO2 of 0.5, temperature more than 35.56, and absence of uh, uncontrolled dyspnea and minimal chest strain, they were extubated, and none of the patients, uh, they were uh, um, uh, re-intubated after the extubation. 
and this is a off pump uh, surgery with uh, no touch technique on the aorta because of the atherosclerotic calcification of the aorta we have done uh, lima to, uh, to lad anastomosis and uh, we have done a y graft using a radial to the diagonal and the om um, uh, can be done uh, and these cases can be done only by off pump because there is a calcification of the aorta and uh, in all uh, for uh, off pump surgery all the anti in general anti hypertensive medication should be continued till morning uh, except ac inhibitors uh, control of diabetes sedative atinolol or metoprolol has to be continued orally and uh, two hours prior to the surgery and uh, ga um, with induction and maintenance uh, uh, usually uh, we do we don't uh, practice sir sorry for the interference dr ravi sir exceeding 5 minutes of the okay Mm. Mm, uh, most of the things um, uh, we do and uh, we keep the um, uh, fentanyl total uh, dosage of fentanyl less than 1000 mics uh, and we give rocuronam um, uh, 1 mg per kg body weight uh, and uh, um, as i mentioned uh, we m- most of the time uh, uh, we keep uh, normothermia and uh, uh, at the end uh, we maintain hemodynamic stability either with the uh, Uh, if there in the emergency cases we use 1 to 2 mics of uh, phenylephrine i may to have a desired uh, systolic uh, blood pressure of around 100 to 200 mics post surgery inotrol preferable or adrenaline or noradrenaline or dobutamine to maintain a mean arterial pressure more than 60 post operative patients are uh, ventilated for 2 to 4 hours until they are fully conscious warm no bleeding and then extubated after a trial of spontaneous exp- expiration respiration conclude to conclude off pump surgery is rapidly emerging as an attractive alternative to the cabg performed during ca- cardiopulmonary bypass it presents a unique challenge to the anesthesiologist in the perioperative period anesthesiologist and surgeon should collaborate and plan the best of perioperative strategy to avoid optimal care and ensure a rapid and complete recovery and thank you uh, thank you dr ragu sir you are fast tracking on your lecture i am i am able to notice that even with the fast tracking it has exceeded no issues you because you have covered not only anesthesia part you have covered about the surgical part also with beautiful uh, diagrams only the beginners want to know what are the epicardial stabilization movements you have given very clarity on that score also that is the reason why the time has been exceeded anyway thank you you have lot of questions to be answered to be ready then uh, now i request uh, dr deepa kane to uh, deliver a lecture on half pump versus on pump cbd madam is a professor uh, faith gs medical college and the kem hospital over to you madam good evening everybody i bring you greetings from st gs medical college and kem hospital my talk is on off pump versus the on pump uh, dr ragu has spoken on in detail about off pump as he said first open heart was in 1952 and first off pump in 51 first stigma to lad in 64 first surgery being graft in 67 the demands for off pump on the anesthetic are very high because of the cardiac positioning which he explained in detail he talked about cardiac stabilization the different techniques and how it is very important to maintain hemodynamics and anesthetic has a very big role in this He's already shown you about the starfish and the octopus and the uh, shunt, intraluminal shunt. So I will not go again into detail. However, the absolute contraindications of pump are hemodynamic instability, poor quality of target vessels, including intramyocardial vessels, which used to be reached vessels, calcified coronary vessels, and congestive cardiac failure, critical left main, small distal vessels, recurrent. Uh, recent acute MI cardiogenic shock for elderly to come relative contraindications for off pump. However, there are a lot of advantages of off pump. There's reduced surgical cost, less equipment, reduced effect of simple bypass, especially the cagulating thing, the transfusion requirement, the blood, the air embolism, cross cramping of the aorta, can get away with all these problems, or there are less number of problems associated with the mass. Preferable in high-risk patients and those with severe atherosclerotic or disease. A patient with preoperative renal dysfunction may benefit with off pump. And diabetics off pump significantly is shown to reduce the total morbidity and decrease the rate of pain compared to the on pump. The disadvantages of off pump mainly are you need very skilled staff. Technically, it's more difficult, difficult in distinct disease, more graft failure. the revascularization 
degradation of in some things as we get into some of the uh, uh, lateral wall or in the inferior wall maybe this is what you know the heart positioning which dr raghu had shown as may be difficult, uh, difficult it may be difficult for the surgeon to revascularize if the renal dynamics are not well maintained and there may be incomplete revascularization and uh, on pump offers a better anesthetic better better revascularization better craft patient so there are a lot of studies on different issues one is short term outcomes looking at the short term uh, short term outcomes on pump versus the off pump in these three studies there is no difference in the 30 day mortality the short term meaning the 30 day mortality no difference is at all found in so many rcts done and the gop tip trial but in the cochrane review they found that the off pump increases the mortality compared to on pump in, uh, when it comes to 30 days in another big trial of 3000 patient arterial revascular trial uh, art trial they found similar mortality in on pump as well as off pump in, a, in one of the recent articles in journal of cardiothoracic surgery uh, regarding short term outcomes of on pump versus on off pump in patients with lv dysfunction the systematic review concluded that this on pump cfg with lv dysfunction if we use off pump then all these problems like stroke myocardial infarction renal failure pulmonary complications infection post operative transfusion reoperation everything goes down compared to on pump coming to the mid term and the long term outcomes mid term meaning at the end of one year or two years and long term would be after five years different studies had shown no difference here beating heart against the cardioplegic arrest studies there has been no difference and some more studies rcts also with the analysis of 4752 patients on pump versus off pump there was no significant differences in mid term or long term outcomes were concerned however in the cochrane review which was published in 2012 molar atal had shown that in off pump there was significant uh, mortality compared to the on pump coming to graft patency when in graft uh, patency uh, also the uh, these studies the beating heart against the cardioplegic arrest studies there is a likelihood of graft occlusion uh, between the two is similar that means on pump versus off pump but in another study where 900 patients were studied and the patients were more than 70 years of age a total of 481 patients out of that underwent angiography at six months and they came to the conclusion that the grafts of on-pump surgery were more fatal compared to the off-pump surgery. Again, in the Ruby trial, it was shown that there was a lower rate of fatality in the cephalus vein grafts also, the type of graft is also important, whether it's a venous graft or the arterial graft. It's not only the on pump and the on off pump. And the patency rate for the lima, that is the left internal tip or LAD, was much better in the on pump compared to the off pump. Temperature regulation is very important in off pump, as Dr. Raghu has told in detail about the temperature management. However, on on pump, it is possible, easily possible to maintain the temperature of patient due to heat exchangers. Whereas in off pump, you have to be very active with warming, keeping operation theaters warm, sterile prep, limiting the sterile preparation of the patients, warming blanket under the patient using warm ice fluid, low fresh tip flows with CO2 reabsorption circuit. All aim, aim is to maintain normothermia. Coming to the complications between on pump and off pump, one of the complications is stroke. The four major causes of neurological and neuropsychological deficits of the CABG are embolization, inflammation, hypoperfusion, and hypothermia. And minimization of this aortic manipulation and avoidance of an extracorporeal circuit reduces the risk of stroke in off pump surgery. There are two types of injuries neurological. One is the one which is the diabetic. And when you have a stroke or a hypoxia, it stops at the end of the procedure. But the other type is the three onset, which is the manifest as intellectual dysfunction, memory deficit. And they are produced both by microemboli and e medical uh, uh, perfusion. There are 50 different studies that 
Pascal in his trial, all showed no difference between all forms and off forms. However, Kovlin and Pascal in some of the articles found an off form is associated with a significant reduction in the scope and the normal incidence of stroke now as compared to 9%. Rehan et al., that is our Indian experience, they showed that further, re further reduction in stroke after off-pump coronary artery bypass reduction, and they had a 10-year uh, study uh, in which they had shown that if off-pump, the stroke rate can even come down and even in high-risk surgery patients. What about renal dysfunction post-operatively? Some trials, like the Ruby trial and the Gorkhead trial, showed no difference whether it's off-pump or on-pump. That is, in the coronary trial of pump, there was a significant reduction in acute renal injury, and yet it all showed that of pump surgery with absolute risk of renal dysfunction for a stroke person, but there is no difference in the risk onset of renal PCSD. What about coagulopathy? The disruption of the coagulation system and the hemodilation that you see with the CT bypass is avoided with of pump, and this is again results in the new study of blood requirement. However, recent reports suggest a hypercoagulable state after off pump, and this state is similar to that of non cardiac surgery, and this has led to use of clopidogrel and aspirin to off tap revascularization. What about SIRS? A combination of this non pulsatile flow, myocardial ischemia, hypotonia, contact of the patient blood with artificial surface of the extracorporeal surface is responsible for inflammatory process. So, obviously, in off pump, the, num the markers for SIRS are found to be reduced compared to on pump surgery. So this is the picture showing the overall surgical trauma. The uh, dotted line is the off pump and the straight line is the on pump. The on pump is more compared to off pump, the surgical trauma and the inflammation. What about the post operative tachyarrhythmias, whether it is on pump or off pump surgery? Arrhythmias, and one of the authors has uh, concluded, however, that tachyarrhythmias in both, both the situation, but a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation in on pump and other types of SVP is seen on off pump surgery. Coming to pulmonary dysfunction, on pump EABG, the pulmonary dysfunction is seen to be more is caused by alveolar acid excesses, inflammation, include shunting and volumen features. About renal dysfunction, patients with preoperative renal dysfunction may benefit from avoidance of CT bypass. Or renal function is better preserved in patients undergoing off pump CABG. We have references for all that. What about the revascularization, whether it's complete or incomplete? Off pump CABG was found to be associated with increased incomplete revascularization, mm. and it was reported in the American uh, Journal of Cardiology in 2018. Repeat revascularization with mortality at 10 years was more compared with the on pump CABG, suggesting that on pump CABG may be the appropriate choice for surgical revascularization. What about the left main coronary artery disease? For now, for most of the patients, left main coronary disease, along with extensive multivessel disease on, on, on pump, appears to be the preferred option as quoted by American College of Cardiology in 2019. Well, another conclusion where it states that off pump compared with the conventional CABG may improve outcomes, all these outcomes in relation to stroke, renal dysfunction, blood transfusion, ventricular failure, atrial fibrillation, wound infection, ventilation time, and length of stay. However, over, this is the short term outcome. What about the long term? Off pump may be associated with reduced toxicity and increased risk of cardiac interventions and even death. So what about the experience of the surgeon? Does the surgeon experience make a difference? It seems it's a learning curve for acquiring expertise in doctor. It's about 50 to 75 cases in a decade in North America that one third of the surgeons do not do off pump. And a vast majority of 86% perform only mid-X-ray So it is not surprising that long term cap results, even in experienced surgeons, are no other issues also, but besides the on pump and the off pump, there are some more issues which actually determine how well the patient will 
do, and that is patient comorbidities, completeness of revascularization, glass-plated use of multiple arterial blocking. And it is important to remember that these factors and not whether the procedure is performed on point or off point will determine the long-term survival of patients following I thank each one of you and wish you all a happy new year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepa Gandhi, madam. Uh, it's a nice lecture, but your audio, your uh, decibel was very low. Oh. And now, uh, uh, probably you are a quiet and uh, soft spoken individual, I think. <laughs> now, over to uh, I think it's as a compliment, sir, but I wish I could, I knew it, I would have talked. Now, yeah, now your voice is very good. <laughs> now, over to Sanjeev, madam. Yes, uh, thank you, Deepa. It was uh, really a nice uh, lecture. Uh, now, coming to the last lecture, last but not the least, delegates, be prepared for lecture by efficient cardiac anesthesiologists, basically from Kolkata, now working in Freeman Hospital in England. And not only that, he has been a fellow of transesophageal echocardiography and has been awarded FAIR, that is Fellowship of American Society of Echocardiography, none other than Dr. Aru Pratham Maithi. He is going to speak on myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery and perioperative MI. It's a very important topic and please delegates listen to him. Aru Pratham. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I give a big thanks to ICA and all the organizers and particularly Dr. Moli Dhasar to give us for giving me this opportunity to speak about this topic. So um, I'll start sharing my screen. Can you hear me? Am yes. I audible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, next 15 minutes, I'll talk about uh, myocardial injury in non-cardiac surgery and perioperative MI. Uh, it's a very important topic. My talk, I will try to be as practical as possible. And I have basically covered what we do in regular day to day if we face such situation. I have no conflict of interest I'll start with few facts of concern. AMI is a significant perioperative cardiovascular complication, and it can happen in 30 million patients worldwide every year who are undergoing non-cardiac surgery. For all surgical patients over 40 years of age, there is a 2.5% risk of perioperative AMI, which in increases up to 25% risk in patients with pre-existing ACS. The incident, incidence of in patients with no history of coronary artery disease lies below 1%, while in patients with known coronary artery disease is 5.6%. This means one who doesn't have any coronary artery disease still can have less than 1% chance of perioperative MI during any non-cardiac surgery in hospital mortality rate is quite alarming anything between 12 to 40 percent and and it's furiously only 40 14 percent of these patients have typical chest pain and 53 percent of them will exhibit typical clinical signs symptoms of ischemia so it's quite difficult to diagnose as well so pmi may be the first manifestation of any coronary artery disease so those who are giving non-cardiac anesthetic to non-cardiac patients. So we should be aware of that, that PMI can be the first manifestation, no history of any coronary artery disease, no history of no symptoms, no ischemic heart disease still, that can be the first manifestation. So this has to be taken very seriously. And any PMI in any case will increase the cost by around 6,000 euro per case if the patient develops perioperative MI. So perioperative MI is mostly silent and ECG is often difficult to interpret and frequently does not exhibit the characteristic ST segment changes. Therefore, there is considerable underreporting of the true incidence of PMI. 
classification of the MI is important or the ischemia. Why? Because the, as we classify, the prognosis is progressively worse for each clinical group, like the prognosis for STEMI is the worst and ischemia is little better, and treatment is different depending upon the clinical classification. Means if the patient suffers from STEMI, obviously he will he or she will need some kind of revascularization therapy immediately. So the uh, cardiac ischemia and infraction can be classified in different classes, acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, non-STEMI, STEMI, every one of you know that I am not going into details, but there is a new thing. There is a larger group of patients who have a rise in troponin for cardiac enzymes, but they don't exhibit any symptoms and neither they have any evidence of myocardial ischemia in an ECG. So they are labeled as having myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery when there is no evidence of non-ischemic etiology. So we also miss, and this, uh, this uh, uh, entity is frequently missed and underreported because most of the time we don't check the, any, uh, we don't check the card uh, biomarker of cardiac injury. So many of the patients may experience this, but may not be clinically evident. Coming to the clinical manifestation of the perioperative MI, so it can range from anywhere being asymptomatic or silent to frank angina, or it can present as a ventricular uh, ectopic or VT, VF, or it can present as isolated left bundle flank block. Even you can find increase in the peak pressure in the ventilator, difficult to finding difficulty to ventilate these patients because the patient has been presented with pulmonary edema and congestion. And suddenly, before understanding any, anything, the patient can die. So the clinical manifestation can vary from nothing to a very catastrophic. So what are the sequence of events? So initially, diastole dysfunction starts, then, then happens the systolic dysfunction, followed by changes in the pulmonary artery capillary wedge pressure, followed by the ECG, and lastly, chest pain. But as you can see, all the events happen in less than a minute, so you can assume how fast things happen. How to diagnose the perioperative MI? It's difficult, definitely, it's not easy. So patients on the GA, you know, they will not complain of any chest pain, but awake patients, they may complain chest pain, but still they may not. Many patients who are diabetic, elderly, with neuropathy, CKD, they may not complain any chest pain at all. It can be silent. And if you give too much of opioid, that can also hide the chest pain and uh, ischemia. But some patients can have a chest sense of chest tightness, refer pain, along with nausea, vomiting, and everything. So what are the common features in ECG? ECG can have any T wave inversion or flattening to start with, followed by ST changes, depression, or elevation. Usually tachycardia is prominent. And let me tell you one thing, the perioperative MI happens towards the later part of the case, at the end of the case, not at the beginning of the case, and post-operative period mostly. So tachycardia is a very prominent feature. Sometimes we have, when you're extubating the patient or before extubation, when you have stopped the anesthesia, patient is having tachycardia, you, you're assuming that the patient is light, but that can actually be a sign of ischemia. A majority of these perioperative MI are non-QF MI. And new LDBB, as I told already, indicates a new MI. What in echo? In echo, we'll, you'll mostly see new regional wall motion abnormality to detect which segment, which coronary territory is being affected. And sometimes if the MI is transmural, STEMI, catastrophic complications like acute MR and mechanical complications can happen. What about the cardiac biomarkers? There are different cardiac biomarkers which, have, uh, which start to rise at, uh, at different time intervals and remain high for different time period. But usual uh, things we do, troponin is the most common biomarker we use and uh, NT pro BNP is a marker which is sensitive but not specific. It can be raised in different conditions like chronic heart failure and any cardiac condition. Lactate and metabolic acidosis, they will invariably rise in case of the myocardial infraction, but they are 
again, non-specific because they can also uh, rise in hypovolemia, in, um, in, in, in infection, in any other causes. So they are, specific, they are sensitive, but not specific. If you have a pulmonary artery catheter by chance, then what you can have, you will see that the PA pressure has suddenly gone up with a raised pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which indicates a high LA pressure. You can have CV wave in PCWP. So you can, in the TOE, you can you know, mostly we see the uh, basal trunk plastic short axis view to know the territory, also you see the fourth chamber and everywhere. And if you're suspecting a myocardial injury and, uh, but uh, the ventricular function is, uh, is uh, not, is all right, you can see use speckle tracking uh, to see uh, if there is any subclinical ischemia. So how we manage practically intraoperative ischemia so these are the physiological goals I think everyone know and it has been discussed. I will not go into details. So what are the techniques to prevent the ischemia and what are the anesthetic techniques? So what we do practically, identify the high risk patients for perioperative MI. The regional technique avoids stress response, better pain control, but make sure you, you have not created a very high block and hypotension and brady that will again precipitate ischemia. In GA, uh, limit your stress response due to laryngoscopy and intubation by various, mo various modes and consider arterial line in high risk patients and central line in prolonged complex high risk cases. Always maintain normal carmia, adequate PO2 and hematocrit. Adequate depth and analgesia is crucial. Treat sinus tachycardia, again telling, treat sinus tachycardia with beta blockers and hypotension with volume load and vasopressors initially and treat hypertension with DTN after making sure your anesthetic depth and analgesia are fine. Always monitor the core temperature. Keep the patients warm. Hypothermia has dramatic effects on oxygen consumption. Hypothermia can increase the oxygen consumption 20 to 30 fold. So you can make out a patient who is compromised can have very easy inducible cardiac ischemia with hypothermia. And also make sure very smooth reversal and extubation are the key to, to prevent the ischemia because the ischemia tends to happen in the later part of the surgery during extubation and post-op. Post-operative pain control is as important as the previous steps. So what do what you do if synop ischemia appears? We are doing a non-cardiac surgery, then all of a sudden you see the T-wave inversion or flattening with some chest pain, tachycardia sweating, then, then, then what you do? Then firstly, we'll see which leads are affected. So we have to see whether the ischemia is uh, right side, I mean, inferior wall or lateral wall or anterior wall, or it's a global ischemia. So if the patient is awake, reassure the patient, nothing has happened, we're taking care of you, you're fine, you'll be doing well, keep yourself calm. Sometimes we get, uh, I mean, anxious, and uh, so we have to keep ourselves calm. Increase the FIO2 as much as possible. Make sure the patient is adequately anesthetized in case of GA and has good pain relief. Treat ischemia with GTN spray and GTN infusion. Correct hypovolemia and give volume and give fluids and vasopressors to maintain a map of 70 millimeter mercury to maintain the cardiac perfusion pressure so the coronary will get more blood. Treat any tachycardia which reduces the diastolic time and causes coronary ischemia with beta blocker, IV beta blockers, mostly small is used. If still there is worsening in the ECG changes, ST changes start happening, they do blood gas, check lactate, send enzymes, and consider doing a echo and involve cardiologist. So now, what if, if the patient from ischemia has developed an intraoperative MI? So follow everything as you did in case of ischemia and again, detect what type of MI it is. Is it anterior, is it lateral or inferior? And whether this is STEMI or this is non-STEMI. STEMI is a transmural MI. It has got more worse prognosis. So, and you have, and there are a lot more implications if the patient has STEMI. So involve cardiologist, involve your senior colleague in, if, if needed and book a bed in ITU. Immediate communication with the surgical team, whether they want to continue or stop. If they're in initial stage of surgery, probably it's better to stop 
if they are just finishing the case, probably just do it first and stop the case and just finish the case. Inform the relatives and explain the path of management, something this can happen, but just explain them properly, otherwise it will be a catastrophic, uh, it, it will be a catastrophic even to them. Give aspirin loading via NGT, consider morphine, treat hypotension aggressively to maintain coronary perfusion pressure with fluids and initial with vasopressors. Intraoperative echocardiography T will be preferable. We look for RWMA, exactly how is the ventricular function, LV and RV, if there is any MR or not, everything has to be looked by echo. And if the LV, RV systolic function is bad, start inotropes putting a central line. Treat any arrhythmia, any tachyarrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, VPC with amiodarone, correct your electrolytes, potassium, magnesium, and if they are unstable with arrhythmia, give them shock. In, in severe hemodynamic instability, intraortic balloon pump has to be considered. Now, you have done this, so what after this? So the focus of subsequent treatment is to re-establish coronary perfusion. So there are two, two, three options. Number one is direct coronary angioplasty, is a treatment of choice depending upon favorable coronary anatomy, but 5% of the cases who are going for PCI, primary PCI will be failed there can be a failed PCI or the coronary anatomy is not suitable or have multi-vessel vessel diffuse disease who can eventually need the emergency CABG and that's that mortality rate of emergency CABG is relatively higher. Thromb thrombolysis is an option. Mm, apparently no, thrombolysis is not an option, uh, but you are if you are doing any surgery which, which does not cause much blood loss, and you are thinking that blood loss will not cause major problem, you can thrombolyze if your institute do not have any PCI option or no option for CABG, and it's a remote institute, you can still go for thrombolyze in that case, but usually not done. So adjun uh, adjunctive medical therapy, like intravenous heparin, dual interplanetary therapy, statin, AC inhibitor, beta blockers all can be titrated and optimized accordingly. Now coming to the post-operative MI. So post-operative MI is still quite common, suspect with chest pain, ST changes, new onset LBBB, ventricular trachea or ventricular fibrillation, hypotension, any of them can be the first sign of post-operative or perioperative MI in ITU or in the ward. So what what will do? If the patient is not in ITU, immediately save him to ITU, put a central line, put an arterial line, urgent bedside echo, see the RWMA, see the ventricular function, treat them as already discussed. But if the patient still uh, is in gross hemodynamic instability in ITU, so what next? Then check regular blood gas, including lactate, metabolic acidosis, maintain the hematocrit, float a PA catheter, uh, check the pulmonary capillary weight pressure and check the LA pressure, how lungs are congested. You can do an X-ray, you can intubate the patient if, if the patient is not maintaining oxygen saturation and by, go by the PCR WP to feed with fluids or inotropes. And uh, the PC, uh, in pulmonary capillary weight pressure, if there is acute MR, you can see CV pattern. And also, once you float the PA catheter, you can take the take the cardiac index, you can take the SDRI, whether you are based upon constricting the patient too much, and you can also check the mixed venous oxygen saturation to actually know how good your tissues are getting perfused. So you have to do a TEE in case of uh, where TTE is not adequate or feasible like in obese patients or COPD, in all these cases, TE is much better. So initiate or escalate or optimize inotropes based on the echocardiography and LV and RV function. In case of acute worsening of hemodynamics, listen to the heart. If there is any systolic murmur, think of any mechanical complications like MR, like ventricular septal rupture or pericardial tamponade can also happen. So immediate echo has to be done to, to diagnose that and in case of severe hemodynamic instability in spite of inotropes and vasopressors and medical management, you have to consider 
a mechanical support like IABP uh, in, a, uh, in any patient and Impella and ECMO, those patients who are younger, less than 65 years. And then you have to consider once you stabilize with mechanical support, you have to consider revascularization if able be. So this is the different prothesis, the intraatrial uh, intraatrial balloon pump. This is the Impella, which is commonly used, which uh, it's like a badge. It's the ECMO, usually you have to use a VA ECMO to support the heart and you can use complex monitor like PICO and all these things. Thank you. Thank you, Arupita. It was a wonderful lecture and very comprehensive and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, I request Dr. Nakshi uh, Sundaram yes. to uh, take us uh, through the questions. Uh, I will take you and then I will join you. So now, the most of the questions and the clarifications are start from uh, Dr. Raghu. That is the reason why I have uh, informed it earlier also. Uh, so, Dr. Raghu, you are online? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, you said that the epidural catheter will be placed to the previous day uh, okay. of the surgery. Okay. Uh, but uh, okay. the delegates wanted the clarity on that because uh, some people opine it can be done on the morning of surgery then uh, if you go about the thoracic epidural with the anticoagulants the patient is taking how you will go about it no most of these uh, patients whom we think a thoracic epidural can be um, uh, inserted we plan one day prior to the surgery because if you have an epidural tap bloody tap, then we have to give respite at least 24 hours before you go for a surgery. That is why we put one day before the catheter and keep the patient in the ICU or in the high density ward to monitor the thing. And you give a test dose. Next day, next day morning, when you come, when the patient comes to the OT, again you give a test dose of 2% xylacin, adrenaline 3 ml and see what happens. And all these patients will stop anti-heparin, uh, antiplatelet uh, drugs five to seven days before the uh, this one procedure. So you will give any bridging therapy at that particular point of time? Yeah, high uh, heparin uh, can subcutaneous heparin five thousand international units eight hourly we can give. So then, how will you plan the epidural catheter in relation to the heparin? Uh, we can uh, just uh, stop uh, for uh, say uh, the before the previous uh, dosage before you put the catheter and then you can start uh, later on after six to eight hours you can start the heparin infusion fine yeah, uh, then can then i add something here yes Only that here yes sir uh, the uh, the problem with epidural is that uh, there is a risk of epidural hematoma that's a you uh, that's a Huge issue, though the incidence is not common, one in 5,000 to one in 30,000. But if it happens, you have to evacuate the hematoma immediately, otherwise, patients will become paraplegic for life. Mm -hmm. That's a serious issue. You have to monitor the neurological function of both limbs post operatively, scrupulously, and then. Uh, detect the epidural hematoma and take the patient to MRI suit to do the uh, MRI scanning to demonstrate epidural hematoma and then patient has to undergo laminectomy then and then. This is a serious issue and the important thing is that if you look at the outcomes of patients who had epidural and just GA without epidural, the outcomes are no different. So there is no big uh, deal in putting the epidural and there is also a problem as Aragu said, if the patient has a bloody tap when you're doing epidural, the case has to be postponed. Case has to be postponed. It cannot be done within the next 24 hours. So this is not liked by surgeons and they, they are unhappy if patient is postponed. Patient, everybody is disturbed. So, because of this, during uh, during epidural is uh, not done in most of the centers. It is not done in most of the centers. That is my response to that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So my even my personal question for him is, he, sir was discussing about Avec uh, regional anesthetic technique for uh, CMP. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, now I want to know how you like it personally, uh, keeping a patient uh, awake uh, and without when we are uh, so very much safe, drugs are available with for general anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. How do you personally feel keeping a patient awake, doing sternotomy and all? What is your personal opinion on that, sir? Uh, personal opinion is that it is adds to extra risk to the patient. And uh, the lifespan of the anesthesiologist will reduce by one year if you are doing two or three cases per month like that. Because you're always on your toes. And if the pleura is open, patient's respiration will be impaired. And suddenly, immediately, the surgeon has to put a chest tube and you will have to apply positive pressure by the either by CPAP or the intubation. So this is this adds uh, sort of uh, emergency situation where you have to act uh, act quickly to avoid any respiratory com compromise. So personally, I do not favor a weak CABG. Fine. So I do uh, not favor a weak uh, CABG. It adds point. unnecessary burden to the patient, risk risk to the patient, and the risk to the anesthesiologist lifespan. Then the, you meant to say the anesthesiologist will develop MI. <laughs> yes. Like, I sir, don't know, then, but the, the, the anxiety levels will be more. Sir, because, again, sir, you yes. said you will keep uh, ACT 300 uh, stents, ACT, but some centers practice uh, 400. So what is your uh, personal opinion in that, Dr. Abhi, sir? Sir, um, actually, in our uh, institute, um, what we are doing is uh, we are keeping ACT a little higher only. But some, um, uh, because some of the post-operative cases, we had some uh, thrombosis of uh, great arteries, that is a celiac artery, superior mesenteric artery. We keep off-pump or on-pump. ACT above 480 only we keep. But there are a few um, surgeons who are a little faster and uh, the coronary vessels are good. We keep ACT 300 and uh, we don't give protamine at all. We just give protamine 25 milligrams and we get out. Uh, most of the uh, times, if we think the vessels are bad, we don't give protamine only. We accept the ACT at 200, we leave it and we manage post op. And most of these patients are uh, have uh, done well with a drain of 250, 300 ml post op over a period of 24 hours. Nothing would have happened. So how will you select the preoperatively whether to keep the ACT at 300 or 480? No, no, sir. Actually, ACT, it is always better to keep at higher uh, level because uh, sometimes, you know, the surgeon can prolong the um, operation. In now uh, one hour, you keep ACT 400. Suppose he's doing the last anastomosis. Uh, um, uh, in 10 minutes, we can, uh, we no need to add a heparin to the patient because ACT is, uh, was 400. If you take ACT, it will be 280, 290. No need to give. You reduce your dosage of protamine and uh, you give, or if you think the vessels are bad and you are not able to graft uh, some uh, vessels, uh, you don't give full uh, protamine to the patient. So if you are uh, looking at the off-pump CABG with the young patient, bad vessels, better to keep at higher ACT and do the procedures. So, uh, so what is your personal preference of induction agent, sir? Etomirate or propofol for CFD? No, sir. Uh, for uh, most of uh, my cardiac cases, I use uh, etomidate. As I told, I don't want to take any stress level during the induction. And most of the patients, uh, I intubate and uh, put a central line or PA catheter. If the pressures are borderline, then I put awake line. And I use only propofol when uh, the patient is having aneurysm, dissection, when I want to reduce the pressure. I use it. Other personally, I always use etomidate for all my cases. Madam, over to you, Madam Sanjeevani, Madam. Yes, yes. Uh, Raghu, you said you are using isoflurane. Yes, ma'am. Very wisely, of course. But can you explain why not seoflurane? So that delegates would, uh, you know, get uh, enlightened about it. Madam, um, uh, say, uh, actually, we, we are having isoflurane or seoflurane only. Isoflurane helps in uh, ischemic preconditioning. That is the only advantage. Mm -hmm. And the um, uh, rest of the things, um, uh, because it is easily available to us, we are using that. Uh, that's it. Okay. 
Okay, Not gold is less expensive. I suppose less, ex less expensive. That's why we use it. But uh, having said that, uh, if you have the option, uh, maybe pure stone is slightly better because uh, it does not uh, decrease the systemic vascular resistance and vasodilatation as much as uh, uh, isoflurin causes. Cost effectiveness is uh, driving us to use ice, more of ice. Okay. Um... And there is one good question about hibernating myocardium and stunned myocardium. Doctor um, um, Manjula Kenan, and she has. Manjula, like, can can you ask? What that? is what is the question? Uh, I think the question is about what is hibernating myocardium and stunned myocardium. Stunned myocardium and hibernating. Hibernating. Okay. okay. Is, is that the question? Uh, okay. Okay. Stunned myocardium means the tissue with prolonged systolic dysfunction even after return of the normal blood flow. So normal Correct. blood flow has returned, but still systolic dysfunction is existing. Yes. That is eastern yes. myocardium. Yes. And hibernating myocardium is tissue with chronic ventricular dysfunction in response to a chronic reduced blood supply. And that if if you, yeah, in hibernating myocardium, if you supply blood, huh? Huh. if the blood is uh, supplied, huh. the myocardium jumps back to life. It right. starts to contract immediately, right. whereas stunned myocardium does not contract immediately. It takes some time, maybe up to 12 to 24 hours. Right. And I always give the example, is uh, Venugopal available? Dr. Venugopal? Bridges, Bridges, yeah, Bridges, I think he has put the question. The, I usually... I usually give the example of a uh, resident working with you. Uh, suppose you have started the case at 7.30 in the morning and you are busy in some meeting and you did not release the resident for lunch and you come at 4 o'clock and the drip, some drip is going fast and you shout at the resident. You have what you have done. You 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 are ruining my case. Something like that. You could shout at the resident. He is stunned. And you tell him uh, you have you have been working for uh, up to uh, evening five without having food. You can't have food and come back. So that guy goes to have food and comes back, but he is still stunned. He is upset that uh, the chief has shouted at him, though he has carefully managed the case. That is stunned man. He will take 24 hours to recover. <laughs> Whereas uh, hibernating myocardium, he says you have a similar case. And he, you come at 4 o'clock in the evening and this resident has been managing the case from morning 7.30 till 4 p.m. And you tell him, I'm really sorry, I was held up in the meeting. You please go and have a lunch. Then, he, and you have managed it very well. How did you manage so well? If you tell him like that, he goes to have food. And though he was tired at the end of, at four o'clock, he comes back with knowledge short enough. <laughs> yeah, that is hibernating myocardium. So hibernating myocardium, if you give the blood, it brings back to life. Whereas stunned myocardium is functionally incap incapable because of some oxygen free radicals have been created, or there is calcium overload, and there is electromechanical uncoupling occurring at the cellular level. Though you have given oxygen, the myocardium is dysfunctional. The chap, though he has had his food at four o'clock, he is not able to function properly because he has been shorted. That same thing is applicable to it. This is an example. Sir, it is, good, it is good to hear from you. Usually, if the discussion is prolonged, the brain will be stunned. But in the way of discussion, it is hibernating. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just giving you an example. I'm just giving you an example. How to understand this phenomenon? This right. is what exactly happens. Actually, yeah, sir's I'm examples are example always very practical and, you know, they are very natural and it is easily acceptable by everybody. So, I always like his examples. So, no, he was. The reason why he is teacher's teacher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, Dr. Deepak, madam, use of tranexamic acid in on-pump and off-pump surgery. What is your opinion? 
actually we use it in both off pump as well as on pump surgeries can i make a comment here yes, yes. Uh, the my comment will be that uh, the in off pump cvg the bleeding is not much first point is it bleeding is not much if you take the take the average blood loss in the off pump cvg it is about 300 to 400 ml even if uh, the uh, patient has uzi it does not usually cross 600 ml unless you see the surgeon is really bad which is not the case in most of the centers surgeons are good they do good hemostasis the blood loss is only 300 to 400 ml so the use of tranexamic acid is not really indicated but if you really want to reduce the blood loss you can reduce the blood loss by using tranexamic acid by about 100 ml from 400 you can bring to about 300 ml so it is not usually uh, preferred uh, uh, usually not i won't say preferred it's not usually given in off pump cvg but there are some surgeons who would like to give it so if the surgeon wants it we give it but if there is any technical problem with the graft the graft may get may get occluded so that that has to be kept in mind and also these patients may have uh, uh some sort of uh, um hypercoagulability because you have stopped aspirin bleed 7 days before so you you give tranexamic acid on the top of that they may develop clots in the graft so that's a fear is there so the use of tranexamic acid depends upon the combined decision between surgeon and the anesthesiologist and in my opinion it is not there's no pressing need to use it. Deepak and Madam, you said you will be using a uh, warm IV fluids. You want to use online warmers or external warmers? So whatever is uh, available, like uh, warm IV fluids would be best if you can get the uh, IV infusers warmers. That would be better. The inline warmers. Okay. That would be. better but it should be available if it is not available then whatever technique but if it is not there uh, madam for the sake of residents i am asking this question when you will decide to come out of cpg what are all the predictive indices we will use to decide to cut off the cpg checklist checklist of the cpg checklist yeah, yeah. checklist checklist uh, yeah, i should ask this question yeah blood gas should be normal potassium yeah. should be normal yeah yeah please come uh, okay the checklist of coming off pump a number 1 mean pressure should be more than 60 or 70 contact should be good hemoglobin should be good temperature should be normal at least 36 and above then avg should be normal and electrolyte should be normal urine output should be good when these uh, these um, checklist is confirmed then only we ask them to go off pump no lung should be the idea of me these are the usual this. criteria correct madam the idea of me asking this question is the reason miller says it is a cvp criteria it gives uh, option 6 uh, predictors for c and for v4 and for v6 like uh, c it is cool that is a mm. temperature then c for cells uh, hemoglobin same way v for ventilation ventilation visualization mm. p says pressure predictor precursors so it is giving a clear that explanation so uh, the resident can go through that uh, then uh, you feel madam in cpb renal dysfunction is more mm. so if patient is having a renal dysfunction can he be benefited by Half pump uh, CVG. Is there any scientific data, or it is only the? Yes, Some of the is. files have said that off pump uh, in patients who have pre-op renal dysfunction, off pump would be better. The renal dysfunction uh, cases of pump would be better. There are trials which said that. I've quoted them in my talk. Yes, yes, yes. Our data also yes. support the view. And also, even if you compare off pump and on pump in patients who do not have renal dysfunction, off pump patients have less acute kidney injury as compared to on pump. If the patient is more than 65 years of age, 
So uh, from renal point of view, from our experience, I'm telling, off pump is the best because of the fact that you are maintaining the pulsatile perfusion, which is necessary for kidney, and also you are not hemodiluting the blood, and you are avoiding that. So all these are risk factors for the. Uh, can I ask, uh, one of, anyone can answer this question. Uh, how much uh, importance do you give for ejection fraction in view of subclinical left ventricular failure? Anyone can address this question. How much you give importance? No, no, you, please identify who should answer the question. I can take this question. Aru, Aru, can, 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 yeah. You only. <laughs> Aru Pratap yeah. can uh, yeah. answer this yeah, so uh, ejection, ejection fraction is nothing absolute, honestly. So if you see ejection fraction is if you go by the formula, endostolic volume minus end systolic volume by endostolic volume. So a, think of a very big heart, very dilated heart, which has very high volume and poor function, but still the endostolic volume will be high and some ejection fraction can be uh, more and uh, in in case of a small hypertrophic heart which is kind of empty functioning well the ejection function can can be low so ejection fraction and again erroneous if you have any regurgitant uh, jet like mr ar and all these things ejection fraction is not absolute absolute is the stroke volume how much stroke volume or cardiac output patient is getting so so the the other markers which are kind of replacing the Ejection fraction now is the myocardial S dax velocity, S prime, and uh, speckle tracking. These are actually the markers to detect the subclinical LV dysfunction. But obviously, uh, in the day to day transthoracic echo practice, when we are reporting, we are not reporting all these things be, because mostly uh, sometimes the technicians are doing the echo, they're just taking the measurements in the emote, and we are just giving the ejection fraction. But still, it's useful i will say um, because if, 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 if advice uh, to have uh, uh, strain or global longitudinal strain uh, figures values uh, before yeah, so, this suppose a uh, left ventricular hypertrophy patient with ejection fraction of 70 but he may be having subclinical left ventricular failure absolutely otherwise uh, strain pattern in these cases yeah, so uh, to, yeah, the ejection fraction can be normal, but to detect subclinical uh, LV function, this function, you have to do the speculative tracking and to strain. Already in Europe and uh, USA, uh, in routine echocardiography, we are reporting strain. And uh, I think also in many centers in India, they are also doing it, but it's quite meticulous. And uh, some people are doing 3D echo and giving everything, all the numbers about each segment. But uh, yeah, but still LV, LV ejection fraction, as we are very comfortable with, can be a good marker, particularly if this is low, that means it's low. Uh, but if, if this is high, it can be high due to MR, AR, anything falsely mm -hmm. high, falsely give you a sense of comfort, this comfort. But if this is low, that means heart is bad. And my question is to Manjula. Uh, uh, Please uh, let the audience know about the difference between right coronary circulation and left coronary circulation. Is there any difference? Is there there is, is a difference. Uh, left coronary circulation is mainly by the left coronary artery and the 75% of the heart is supplied by that artery. And right coronary circulation is by the right artery and only 25 to 35% of the heart is supplied by that. So if anything goes wrong on the left side, the symptoms are going to be more and the patient will be symptomatic. But right side may be hidden by the um, uh, symptoms. So the patient will not come to you so uh, easily or so hurriedly. So left side symptoms are more. So this is the main difference in the left side and right side circulation. Okay. And one more, Madam. One more uh, important one, thing uh, uh, about the right side I want to uh, mention that the filling of the right coronary artery happens both in systole and diastole. The mm -hmm. left coronary artery filling mostly in diastole, but right coronary artery also happens in systole and diastole. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you increase the, keep the systolic pressure high, so at least the RCA will be perfused. And if you have good collateral, RCA can give blood to the LCA, I mean that area. 
it is adequate uh, margin for oxygen extraction oxygen extraction because the requirement is as it is rv being very small and less thick than rv the oxygen requirement is less so there is a more margin of safety okay. uh, again madam uh, madam again uh, the most of the time the right coronary artery supplies the conduction system yes. and the left coronary artery supplies majority of the myocardium so the left coronary patients will present with a shock a cardiogenic shock and this right coronary patients will be admitted with uh, dysrhythmias oh. and hypotension yeah. and, and again, i i want to ask that uh, anupratan what is the role of uh, troponin in identifying post operative myocardial infarction post operative myocardial infarction in in, yeah. in cardiac surgery or non cardiac surgery yeah in cardiac surgery yeah cardiac surgery, surgery. yeah yeah so uh, there is still some role of troponin because if you you are doing the cardiac surgery you are opening the heart you are dissecting vessels dissecting myocardium obviously you are creating some injury itself the troponin will be high but how much high we don't know so if, how much if it high? is more than 10 times the yeah, upper yeah, reference limit that that is a criteria for diagnosis of acute mi post cabe in first 40 seconds yeah but the thing yes, is that yeah, yeah, the, i agree sir definition of myocardial infarction i agree but uh, many a times if you do troponin you will see the post operative troponin straight away comes 18 20 like that so rather than going to a absolute value what you do you have to see the troponin trend you have to send it a 0 hour 4 hour and 12 hours if the troponin trend is rising that means the active myocardial injury is going on Mm-hmm. and probably then you have to think and intervene whether drugs are doing well you have to you can take the patient for angio so troponin trend is probably a better marker than any absolute value no, I agree. Is, uh, that is uh, that i agree but as per the definition it is more than 10 times yes sir yes yeah. yes sir that's, i agree that is taken yes. as a criteria yes. now i think we need to wind up we are time our time is up our time is up to 9 pm before i conclude i would like to comment um, the, on the last last topic the four factors which in, influence the treatment of perioperative mi is one is the age if the patient is more than 75 years and has comorbidities you might have to explain the risks to the patient's uh, relatives and need not be very aggressive and second factor which determines is the hemodynamic stability whether the patient is reasonably stable or unstable if the patient is unstable you have to consider aggressive therapy and type of mi if the st segment is elevated then it, it goes in favor of interventional techniques and the fourth factor we have to consider is the bleeding risk if the bleeding risk is high we have to go for conservational therapy with iabp and inotrope conventionally support with that i would like to conclude this uh, meeting i am really really happy that all the five speakers have done very well and dr manjula sarkar talk about pathophysiology alok about non cardiac surgery ragu about off pump cabg deepa about comparison of off pump and non pump and uh, finally arup pratan about perioperative me all the topics were very well covered i really enjoyed this i would like to thank meenak sundaram and sanjeev nandar for their excellent uh, moderation and uh, i wish you happy pongal and uh, thank i would like to thank thank uh, radha krishnan and others involved in icia activities and sanish for the technical and other support thank you very much we'll thank meet you, again sir. sir can i say ek, one may can i say something yes yes uh, i just want to say thanks to anesthesia tv also who has sure, played sure, sure. our program today and uh, th- more than 1000 viewers are uh, viewing this program so congratulations to everybody for uh, excellent you, um, presentation and murli sir so no doubt about it. thank you thank so you, much thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much thank you icu thank you thank, thank you, 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 thank, you thank, thank you murli sir thank you thanks for everyone thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you hello thank you thank you sir thank you. good night good night Thank you.